your um, your background and size, and probably what I'm not necessary. <laughs> okay, um, I, I think we agree to disagree here. Yeah. Um, and and let's uh, have Steve. Uh, <laughs> Um, all right. Okay. Uh, so we we now have um, our lovely Steve uh, presenting his uh, um, new paper. Um, Energy and production functions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. Okay. I'll be going through. I've got an interview at 5:45 uh, with Russia today, by the way. So I'll be rushed out of here, unfortunately, to do that. Uh, what I'm trying to do is bring energy into production in a, in a fundamental way, and it's been bugging me for some time that this statement is an extremely true paraphrase of the way that economists in general have treated energy, in other words, they haven't. Uh, this is a wonderful statement from uh, the physicist Eddington, a bit like a, uh, a popularizer of physics back in the 1920s, and said basically, if you have a theory which is, contradicts Maxwell, well, Maxwell could have made a mistake. If the experimenters, they can get it wrong too as well. But if you're wrong, if you don't follow the second law of thermodynamics with your theory, your theory is nonsense. Now, finally, that applies to all theories of economic growth. None of them as yet <coughs> include an energy in an essential way. And uh, the last school that actually did, if you take a look at the history, is actually the physiocrats, which we don't talk a lot about these days. We should talk about a lot more about them because given what they knew at the time, they saw land as a source of all wealth and land as a source of all profit. And land was effectively for, for solving the only form of energy that really mattered in 17th or 18th century rural France, which was sunshine. So they saw the earth giving a free gift as the basis of profit. And it's quite beautifully, I found very, very clear way of writing in the physiocrats. The project divides into two parts. One pays for the subsistence and profits, notice that, of the worker. The second becomes the, to the uh, this independent disposable part to the proprietor as a free gift. So effectively, the capitalist, the worker is getting some, some surplus out of exploiting free energy. The capitalist who owns the farm gets most of it. Very, and, and very much productive energy plays an essential role. And then you get a class distribution of income on top of that. I think it was marvellous. They were wrong about saying agriculture is the only one that can capture that free gift of nature. But they were right to say the free gift is essential for production. So given what they knew, they're the only school of economics, I think, that has thus far properly incorporated energy. And when we come along with Smith, Smith, of course, spent some time with the physiocrats. But he really switched away uh, from seeing land as a source of energy to labour. And I think in that we started losing this essential insight of the, of the physiocrats. And notice how the definition that Smith uses of wealth is stolen from Cantillon. So there's clearly the influence there, but the wrong thing was picked up. He focused on the division of labour as a source of wealth and then talked about value commanded and value embodied and so on. Uh, and therefore labour became the focus and land and energy therefore started to disappear. Now, of course, it disappeared completely when you got Marx coming along saying that the sea the, the whole source of profit was the difference between the means of subsistence that the worker was paid as a wage. I've got to go fast, mate. I'm sorry with the timing. I've got to, no, I'm going too quickly. I always do, but I'm doubly bad today because of an interview at 5.45. Um, but the capitalist gets uh, the capacity of labour to do work. Gap between the, the value of labour power and the value it can transmit is the source of profit. And there's nothing that you can say comes out of, out of, um, out of machinery, as I'll show in a moment. And the neoclassicals, in fighting against Marx, taking the classical school of economics and turning into a critique of capitalism rather than a defence, they pretty much gave no rank to any input, both labour and capital produced output, but there was no clear concept of surplus and certainly no role for energy. The post-Keynesians, on the other hand, again in reactions to the neoclassicals, work in terms of they reject the idea of easily, smoothly substitutable factors of production, but they also have no explicit role for energy. And even if you look at the ecological economists, there's still no proper equation that essentially includes energy as part of production. So the Marxist the labour theory of value got them saying surplus derives from and is proportional to the labour input. Neoclassical saying you've got output by smoothly substitutable factors of production using the Cobb-Douglas production form there. Post-Keynesians using output by fixed proportions, and clearly that applies to my work as much as anybody else's. Uh, there have been some attempts, and the most sophisticated is by Kummel and Ayers and Vordelis, uh, who Vordelis, by, by the way, being Danil's PhD supervisor, uh, talking about output including energy inside their see that have K to the alpha, L to the beta, and E to the 1 minus alpha minus beta. And that gives you a log, a log for, they call it a Linux, it's a linear exponential form when you put it uh, in a, a more substitutable form. So no energy input there, no energy input there. None here either. 
here you have an energy input, but if you set the beta and the alpha co components to the right value, 1 minus alpha minus beta can equal 0. So it's still possible to have zero energy input in that equation. It's still not making energy an essential insight. Actually, staying with Bob, we're good friends, Bob Babers, uh, I realised that living in his house, which is full of sculptures, maybe this is the reason why the idea came to me, the whole idea of labour and capital without energy is absurd. Labour without energy is a corpse. Okay? Capital without energy is a sculpture. Okay. That simple little insight, and I thought, well, let's see, what you've got to then do is see, let's see labour and capital as means to harness free energy and think of GDP as useful work. Okay. It's got a monetary expression, but I'm talking now the, the real, the way you measure the real GDP. So my basic expression is say, well, let's see useful work as a function of capital and labour both harnessing available free energy. Free, of course, not, not that it doesn't cost any money, but we didn't create it, it's just there. So the actual labour dependent done the work by the by, done by the labour and capital depends on first of all how many units there are, and of course we have all the issues with how we define K. The flow of energy each of those harness, the ratio of, 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 of useful energy to necessary energy for both those elements. You've got to eat roughly three to two thousand calories a day. If you were if you're Arnie Schwarzenegger, you might eat six thousand calories a day. You could do about three thousand calories of work. So that's that's the exergy to energy ratio. And then finally, how efficiency you use that. Defining it in the absolute essential sense of efficiency, the, my, my efficiency of one would be the amount of energy needed to move a one kilo weight from this end of the room to the other in one second with no friction. Okay? That would be your essential definition of 100% efficiency. Of course, we're nowhere near that. So that gives me an expression like this where I haven't as yet given a form to the equation. And, of course, you can do you can replace the XCGD energy ratio with, X, with XK and XL for labour, which is what I've done there. So putting it in the form that the, the Cobb-Douglas production form, a multiplicative form, which makes sense, labour multiplies the productivity capital and vice versa, uh, you get this expression, and it doesn't take much work to rearrange it and get this one. And what you have of there, of course, are the components of that for the classic Cobb-Douglas production function. The units of capital and labour as in a standard production function. The energy input to labour, uh, the useful work output of labour, and the energy parameters there, you can pretty much, you know, rule of thumb does fine, maybe 4,000 calories a day, whatever that works out in, in megajoules, I don't know, but you convert it to megajoules to make it the same as the factor for capital. Let's say the exergy energy ratio is 0.5. Eat 4,000 calories, you can do 2,000 calories worth of work. Let's say the efficiency is 0.5. This is all just arbitrary numbers. Effectively, you've got a constant there raised to a power. And, of course, the the the, 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 um, you know, the higher the power, the lower the, the value of the constant. But that's just now a constant. Now, the part that is variable is the input to energy. And there you have the energy that, uh, that, uh, that a capital machinery can harness. We've gone from the days of the, of the, of the uh, Watt steam engine when you, we're working in a maybe a ton of coal a day, to the energy of the Falcon 9, we're working in thousands of tons of oil in seconds. Um, so, and the, the exergy ratio and the efficiency are also time varying. We don't have any data. We don't know which direction they're going, and we hope they might be going up, but we don't really know. It'd be intriguing to find out. So, what we get finally is a formula like this, saying output meaning useful work is that constant times the labour input raised to one power, capital to another, with energy for capital also raised to the same power as capital itself. If we compare it to the Cobb-Douglas production function, it implies the solo residual is actually the energy contribution of labour, of capital to output. No wonder it takes up so much of the actual statistical findings. If I compare it to the Kumulaire's form, where they have a, this is, they've got a couple of production form as well as the Linux form, there's one less degree of freedom. So it's harder to fit my model to the data, which is actually a good thing, more constrained. And you can also put it in terms of output per worker form or capital per labor output worker form, which you can't do with the Linux function because the Linux doesn't have the right exponent values. So I can say output per unit of labor is some function of capital per unit of labor times the energy, the machinery in general. And I can also relate it to the amount of useful work that a machine can do. If we work by machines per head, and, and the exponent now becomes a scaling factor. It's no longer tied up with the theory of income distribution as it is with the uh, 
Cobb Douglas production function. But of course, the big problem is K. We don't know what K is, and if you know the Cambridge controversies, which of course the non neoclassicals won, despite what the <coughs> neoclassicals themselves think. Uh, if so Samuelson conceded defeat on that one, we can't work out what K is. It's a big measurement problem. But we do actually have data on total energy used by industry per capita. So we can actually use that. I can substitute the total energy for the for the, for that, for the broken down figure of machines times energy per machine, which we don't know. We do know the aggregate. But that yields another equation where I'm now saying output is the constant reflecting labour times labour raised to one power times the energy used by cap, used by machine in, in, uh, in production raised to another power. I'm just using constant returns there for, for, for um, ease. So there's my final equation. Now let's put this in per capita form because, again, using the fact that it's only the two exponents there, I can actually reduce this to... Uh, I, I can divide by output by head on one side of the equation. That gives me employment on one side and also energy per capita on the other. So the final equation becomes this, where that is, is GDP per capita, and we know that's got a cyclical trend to it. Energy per head, which has a trend. Not what you might expect, by the way. <coughs> and employment, the employment rate, which is cyclical plus the energy factors, which we don't really know. So it's obviously going to be a gap between how well I can fit this equation to the data and the data itself, because two of the essential components, which are time varying, aren't going to be known. So we put that together, and let's take a look at what it implies empirically. This is GDP per head for America in $90.60, finally starting to recover after the financial crisis. This is employment rate. Now, this is one reason Donald Trump got elected, people. Okay. If you look at this data, this is completely different to what the unemployment data tells you. This is asking how many people have jobs in factories. It's not distorted by all the crap they put forward to question people about whether they've looked for a job in the last two weeks or not. The employment rate peaked in 2001. It was lower again before the, before the boom collapsed, and it's now, it now hasn't recovered. There's 4 million Americans between the ages of 25 to 54 who had jobs in 2000 and don't have jobs now when you adjust for demographic change. No wonder Trump won. Okay. Now, his energy consumption per head. Much to my amazement, when I saw this, I thought, holy shit, I'm going to have a hard time fitting this to the data because there's your peak right back in 1979. So, of course, a large part of what we see here would be made up in the other two terms, the efficiency and the energy 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 ratio, which I don't have data for. But clearly that would comp I mean that we certainly haven't had a decline in living standards over that time. It's been at least constant for the majority of people. So a lot of that decline would be made by a rise in the two factors that I don't have data for. But when I put it together, amazingly enough, of course there's going to be some correlation between GDP per capita and the employment rate. There'll be a correlation between GDP per capita and the energy ratio. The question is, can I improve the correlation by including my equation where energy turns up as an essential factor? And the answer is yes. When I just have uh, uh, energy only, I get a correlation of 0.59. When I have the employment rate only, I get a correlation of 0.62. Include the function with alpha set to 0.7, and I get a correlation of 0.79. And I'm no econometrician, as everybody in the room, especially Chris, knows. Uh, so I'm working with uh, um, Michael Kumar from the Bank of England and uh, Tiago, a, a, a Portuguese econometrician that uh, is good friends with uh, Michael to get the, a joint paper doing this uh, panel data for the planet as much as we can find it. So what we now have is, a, is an expression. And what amazes me how bloody simple it is. I expect something complicated to come out of this. I was stunned with how simple it is. There's the role of energy and technology. There's the role of profit and finance. And there's the role of class struggle, effectively. Those three elements together determining what we get in total out in, in, in real output, and then, of course, we get price dynamics on top of that. So we get a way to tie together a whole range of issues which are an essential part of capitalism, energy, innovation itself, finance and the class struggle. And it's fundamentally right. The physio, we're getting back to the, doing what the physiocrats gave us in the first place and we lost. And it should make it possible as well to integrate this with ecological theory because, obviously, having the use of energy, there's also necessarily the second law implications and the waste we generate, the physical waste. And you can increase the sophistication by talking about breaking it down into renewable, which, of course, we, we only live on renewable energy, except for the, oh, most of what we live on is in renewable energy. And they've got issues about the transition towards renewable energy from, from non-renewable, what that implies in terms of energy return and energy invested and so on. And then for non-renewables, of course, the whole role of depletion 
pollution and so on. So that's uh, another question. What, what does this do? If we bring this model, this equation in, and again, I'm, I'm using Edmonton here, it's the only one so far that actually essentially says energy is essential. And on that basis, it should be something which we should be able, able to adopt across schools of economic thought. But if we do that, what do we have in terms of those schools of thought? If you think about the neoclassical school, it ties together production and distribution. The meritocratic nature of the model says that inputs receive their marginal products. And that's, but if you say, well, in fact, it's energy that produces most of the output, there's no way it's meritocratic in terms of a distribution anymore. It's a struggle between the two social classes as to who gets the, the benefit of the energy. We're not paying coal for its contribution. Nobody pays the sun on a daily basis since the days of the Egyptians. So the energy does not receive a payment, but it's the major source of output. The output goes to the owner of the energy and then labour and capital fight over that distribution of that surplus. So the payments to the means of production in that sense, as we call them, are far higher than their marginal product. It's got nothing to do with the marginal product. So if you did it with neoclassical theory, you wouldn't have neoclassical theory anymore, which would not be a bad thing, in my opinion. <laughs> okay. uh, what about Marxists? Well, I'm... We might not know that I'm about as unpopular with Marxists as I am with neoclassicals. In fact, my only death threat has come from a Marxist so far. Mm -hmm. That may change with time, but we'll see. Well, Marxists <laughs> argue that surplus value is proportional to the labour input. Let's put it through this equation. There's the expression. There's useful work, number of workers, uh, the amount of energy they consume, the amount of the machines that exist with all the issues of the Cambridge controversy, the energy they consume and then the efficiency and exigent relationships and so on. Those are our various components. Now, if we express Marx's claim, and it's not Marx's claim, by the way, he made a mistake, okay? He had two theories of value. I focused on the one that doesn't end up in this dead end, but most Marx is stuck with a dead end. If you say labor is the only source of value in this model, then it means your exigy relationship here must be zero. The actual amount of useful work a machine can do is identical to its cost of production, according to Marx. Therefore, that ratio is zero. Now, if you feed that in, then so they put it in Marx's terms of surplus divided by necessary plus surplus labour, then we can feed that into the expression as well. Again, I know I'm doing this too quickly, but I'm conscious of my time. Bloody hell, I've done it in 15 minutes. No one's looking all stunned back there. Um, so now I have this rate of surplus, surplus coming, not rate of surplus, but surplus itself. 2,000 calories per worker, effectively what the S stands for, times the number of workers. So let's see if we can actually express Marx's claim, which you'll find in volume one of Capital, that even if a machine costs 150, it can under no circumstances add more than 150 to product. Well, that, of course, means XK has to be zero. Um, and then when you say that's the case, then you've got two possibilities. If you feed it into your equation and find you're saying the GDP is therefore zero, we can't do that. The only way to make sense of it is set the exponent for capital and therefore the energy capital uses also to zero. So if you do that, your equation reduces to saying the GDP is the number of workers times 2,000 calories per worker times the efficiency of work, which means total GDP is of the order of 1,000 calories per day. I'm sorry, that's back in the Stone Age. Okay, that's where the theory belongs making the energy count for nothing. So it's one way I have of categorically getting rid of the trash in the labour theory of value and getting Marxists out of the, out of the brown paper box. Uh, no way this is going to be anywhere near true. So let's reject that one. Uh, Post-Keynesian, well, there's no inherent conflict in the sense that there's no theory of production. Uh, can I ask something you Pardon? Yeah, sure. Uh, doesn't the Marxist theory rest on the fact that at the end of the day all machinery is labour? That becomes a piece of esoterics, okay? It, I've, I've got friends. I've got friends who say that Mark, you know, labor is creative and therefore labor is the source of all value. Yeah. Labor at the end of the day, it's what? Else. what it is is energy. Is no, I, th I think you actually make a machine. You can say most of what machines are is embodied energy, not embodied labor. We do the design. I'm not saying we're dumb, okay? We, do, we our intelligence is an essential part of being able to exploit this free energy. That's the essential role of humanity in this. Of course, that's the case. But to then say that the output, profit output only comes out of the energy input of the labour. And remember, Marx's expression was about unskilled labour. It wasn't about Elon Musk or Einstein contributing. It's unskilled labour. Let's get rid of it. 
<laughs> it belongs in the, in, the, in the dustbin of history for more than the reasons I'm just giving here. And what I think can come out of this is also a change in how we have the Schraffian critique of neoclassical economics. One of the points that's made by people like Solo back is that, you know, how do you finally say what out, how do you increase output and so on? And capital plays an essential role. And there's, we've got a big fight over how heterogeneous <laughs> capital is. But when you think of capital as a way of exploiting free energy, each form of capital is designed to exploit free energy in its own industry. And maybe there's more homogeneity coming out of the energy inputs than we actually can see if we look at the capital inputs alone. It's totally speculative. I don't know, but it's one of the thoughts I've had about it. And that could change the nature of the Schraffian critique. We could go to having Schraffer based on embodied energy rather than embodied labour, which could be an intriguing little exercise worth a couple of PhDs. And, of course, there's also going to be very little labor, capital labour substitution which supports the post-Keynesian position because substituting a labourer for, for a machine is a dramatic drop in the amount of energy. The ceiling of the energy can get out of the machine. Going in the opposite direction is a huge increase in the amount of energy that can be exploited in the, in the production process. So I think it explains why you have such relatively fixed ratios in the short term in practice and why so much technological change is labour saving, not labour enhancing. It just doesn't go in that direction because if you go from capital to machine to labour, you reduce your maximum energy throughput from tens of thousands of, of calories per second to, you know, a thousand calories a day. <coughs> so that's the argument done in bloody fast time. I'll need to slow myself down. How cute. I just took my bloody watch and it's turned over. I've got a Mickey Mouse watch showing up now. It actually serves me right. So I did that in 20 minutes. My apologies there. A bit of a, um, I, my next book has been nothing like this. It's on uh, can we avoid another financial crisis? That's coming out in April. And uh, to follow up on my little comment at our little staff meeting beforehand, uh, as well, I'm going to be starting a crowdfunding website, which uh, I'll be saying wherever I go and talk about come to Kingston, but I'm going to be trying to raise my cash out of this in future. Thank you. <laughs> Paul. Uh, should yep. you adore um, Paul? Yeah. Uh, just two points. One is, one is that um, uh, there you may find that there are partisans of, uh, and, and this is for you to check out, Nicholas Georgescu Rogan. Yeah. yeah. And it's for you to decide whether or not you need to put a footnote to him. Oh, lots of footnotes. So this, this is just saying Rogan didn't actually have an equation for it. He was focused more on the entropy issue. He didn't come up with an energy equation. So in terms of when I write this up properly, Rose has got to get a huge, much more than a footnote. You may want to consult his, uh, his star uh, pupil, who is uh, Ali Shamsavari, by the way. Indeed, uh, I will. The second, the second thing is that I, 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 I was not surprised about this thing about energy, energy use mm -hmm. because it's a, a stylized fact about mm -hmm. the technology that... For any well-defined drastic declines in the amount of energy needed, but at, but, per ton of but at the same time, there's a huge increase in the energy we actually exploit. If you think about the amount of energy involved in finding out who was the fastest man in the world in 5000 BC, it was you know, a bunch of proto-Greeks running around a running track, and the amount of energy is the energy a person expends to cover you know, 100 metres. These days, we measure the same thing by people flying around in F1, Formula One cars. The amount of energy we therefore use for all those various activities has dramatically increased, as well as the efficiency rising to some extent. The main thing is the huge increase in the amount of energy we're using. Yeah, but this other effect is very, very important. Oh, yeah. I mean, we'd all be dead by now 10 times over in terms of emission, in terms of emissions. If if that energy efficiency had risen yeah. in standard activities yeah. a great deal. It has. So I've been clear from that but, particular piece but, of data there. What I'm saying, you should be able to match. It's possible to make some implication for it, but the thing is at various times, you if you have a, a huge rise in the price of oil, that's likely to mean much more efficient use of oil than a transfer to other, uh, other uh, energy inputs which are more efficient again. Equally, if the oil price falls like crazy, you go back to wasting and stuff. So there isn't necessarily a permanent time trend in that efficiency function. In the long term, it always goes to it Yeah, but the thing is that it can never reach one. That's one of the arguments from the 
second law of thermodynamics, and nor can the exergy available energy reach one. So we've got limits there. They are definitely below one. Okay. No, no. Yeah. All I'm saying is that to produce a ton of steel, yeah, uh, energy use per ton of steel has dramatically fallen. And, yeah. and and seems to fall no matter what is happening. In terms yeah, but of equally water. equally a hundred years ago we didn't use steel. We used iron. Right. Yeah, we didn't have iron. We, had, we we didn't use aluminium. We'd have aluminium. Or, yeah. So it's, we've it's, much more energy embodied. Yeah. Yeah. Which German which date of the Common Air's paper appear, please? Oh, I've got that in the references. So I'll, I'll pop it your way. Yeah, yeah. Julian. Um, and the first is, I think, what you showed us looks fantastically interesting, important potentially. Um, for a time when mankind is in a position to realise that Marx called this. Louder, Julian, please. Yeah, speak up, yeah, speak up, Matt. <laughs> Talk up, because yeah. it's all being recorded for YouTube, so. Um, but the question is, what would you critique of Marx is misplaced because I think you're doing something completely different. You're, you're producing a theory of surplus wealth. Marx's theory is a theory of surplus value as it works under capitalism. And the, as you rightly pointed out, the capitalists don't account for the energy. And that's what's one of the things that's wrong and irrational about well, I, I, capitalism. I, I, the fact that Marx's theory of capitalism <laughs> isn't the same as your theory does it mean that Marx's theory of capitalism is wrong? It means your theory is about something else. No, in fact, it means my theory of, of capitalism derived directly from Marx's dialectics and rejects the labour theory of value. I said, Marx, Marx is, the, is the foundation of all my work, but it's on an interpretation that contradicts the labour theory of value from a philosophical point of view. I'm very pleased that this one comes and contradicts it from an energy point of view. Let's just get rid of the labour theory of value. I, I did one of my papers once that if, if, a, if a 19th century Machiavelli wanted to sterilise the left, he could have had no better weapon than the labour theory of value. He spent all their time fighting over that bloody piece of crap rather than actually analysing capitalism properly. And that's why Marxists have no contribution to seeing the crisis coming, okay? Because they're, they're totally obsessed by trying to solve an insoluble problem. By the time they got rid of it. Um, yeah, I'll second Jude's uh, <laughs> first, first point. Um, I don't, I've been in too many hours of meetings to think about what I'm doing, I'm um, slightly confused about how you're treating capital. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, it seems to me that usually in, a, in one of these production functions, labour is hours. Labour is usually measuring hours per yeah, year. Yeah. And capital is usually a stock. Yeah. Uh, so it's a stock by relationship. You have that um, the multiplicative constant A is essentially a way of making up humans work. Mm, mm. You, you can say, well, I'm about interpreting it. Terms of fact, yeah. But part of it is get ready for the units work. Yeah. Um, well, in fact, that's and a very... I was a bit confused about how you kind of got rid of, of, of capital. Like, are you interpreting capital as a flow? No, well, you've made a very good point there, actually, and it's worth elaborating because standard Cobb Douglas production function has got labour in hours per, per unit of time multiplied by a stock. There is a stock flow error in the, in the standard Cobb Douglas production function. When you include energy inside there, this is you're getting insight to this all the time, what you're then talking is about a flow of energy per unit of time. So bringing in energy actually makes the equation dimensionally correct in a way that it's not in its raw form. We just have A. Okay. That's a very useful point. But sorry, A is there to correct it, and I agree with what yeah. you said. Yeah, but see, A, A then, what, what, what is A? And A has been said technological change and, you know, that sort of, it's not. It's, it's, it's partly that. It's the energy contribution of capital over time. So we're actually specifying more correctly what A actually is. And rather than the cludge to get the dimensionality right, we've now got a sensible expression because we now have the energy flow of labour. That's, that's what's embodied in this expression here. Also, more explicitly in the original but you've got the energy flow of labour per unit of time, the capital energy flow of capital per unit of time, and GDP is useful work per unit of time. Okay? And when we get down to... to um, what's the second part of your point? 
I've lost the second point. How do you get lost? So the, I think that the problem is there's some of E K equal to K. E K. Yeah. Why do you claim that? That's a, that's a weird. Oh, that's thing. because we don't know either K or E K. This is the number of machines yeah. which we don't know times energy per machine which we don't know. What we do have data on is energy, total energy consumed by the American industrial sector. Right. That's the data I'm using. So, but it doesn't replace K times EK. Uh, it, it, it does because it's saying the energy used by capital. I'm replacing a number of machines which we don't know times energy per machine which we don't know. But what it's talking about is the total energy usage by machinery. How much energy goes into machines in production versus how much goes into people. I think you should have denoted them differently. Yes, Second yeah. K is per unit of Yeah, yeah that's right. I've just, the first yeah. one is the aggregate. That's, what's that's, that's why I've got, sum. I've got the sum. I've got the sum. I'm trying to indicate by the sum there, but it's clumsy. I'll take your point. But no, but so, sorry, but the K is a stock, and the sum of EK on the left is a flow. Yeah, it's K. The K, the K is a stock. E per K is the flow of energy per machine per unit of time. Yeah. So the so flow there is a flow. Yeah. Flow. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be measuring this in in you know, kind of terajoules per year. So, so how? So in, so again, in, the, in the final again, result. Yeah. Do you not need some kind of multiplicative constant to get rid of the <coughs> units? Do you get rid of... In, no, in, no. The, in the final, you end up with that y equals 1,000 to the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What's the, the, the 1,000? Is it meant in something? Or is oh, the 1,000 is just a way of paraphrasing the labour, the, 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 the energy input of labour. Okay? It's just saying, if you're looking at the labour input, the energy coming from labour, then it's just the calories that we don't... <coughs> That we can actually use to do work as unskilled workers. It's a, it's, it's a rough. I, I could put the full expression inside there, but it's just a way of going from this one, where I don't specify what EL and XL and EL are, to saying, well, they're roughly going to be about a thousand. Okay. So, so, so you, are you measuring is everything on both sides of that equation measured in terajoules? Calories or megajoules or, or billion, whatever the MTU, the, all the terms that the engineers use that I'm going to have to learn now. Uh, for specifying energy usage per unit of time. I mean, British thermal units are one they use, and millions of oil, barrels of oil equivalent, et cetera, et cetera. But you'd be converting across to that, and then you'd have a standard measure measuring useful work on one side and a standard way of uh, the same standard used for the inputs on the other side. So, so you end up with GDP as measured by... Yeah. Yeah. Which again, I didn't expect. That's that makes sense. It makes because GDP fundamentally is useful work. Okay. Useful work is moving um, something from one point to another, bending a piece of steel, etc., etc. Yes, but, it, but it's, uh, it's stuff, right? So it's as stuff. You said, as you said, the way to make stuff changes in time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so you could have you know two two different points in history where you have the same your GDP mm. right energy per time. Yeah, but uh, but the amount of uh, stuff that we, we have is very different. What oh yeah, doing with that? well that's a time there'll be a time trend in both, and that's part. I'm using the like the time trend in energy per machine or energy total energy used by industry is very very clear, very apparent. If you take a look at you know the, the wonderful paper you may have you may have seen called Finite Physicist Meets Exponential Economist. Yeah. Seen that one? Yeah. Okay. You look at the long term data going back to like 1700 for per capita energy consumption. In America, it's almost a perfect correlation with GDP, yeah. and this is a, a brush, an explanation for why that correlation is there. I'm not sure you get that. I, I, said, I thought the argument was if we got more clever, the argument coming to you was if yeah. we got more clever, yeah. then the machines wouldn't have to use so much energy. The useful work would go down by your measure, but yeah. the standards would go up. Well, the trouble is you haven't got a great deal of flexibility there in terms of the main thing you've got efficiency, flexibility with is how efficiently you use energy. So my favorite instance of illustration of this is, is motion. You want to get from Los Angeles to San Francisco. If you wanted to measure the, the absolute maximum efficiency of doing that, let's say you weigh 100 kilos, you want to move, say, 1,000 kilometers, you want to do it in one hour, and you want to stop, Okay without killing yourself. Well, you can actually work out exactly what the energy would be involved in. That. That's your perfect efficiency. Now, looking at driving there or going on a horse and buggy, you know, it, it's how many people can you move. Those sorts of changes would, would turn up in it. On that basis, Elon Musk's um, what we call hyper hypertube. Is it hypertube or mm -hmm. hyperloop? That would be the closest, probably the highest efficiency we can reach until we start getting 
you know, Star Trek transporters to move us from one spot to another. But you'd still need the energy. So there's a tremendous amount of room for improved energy. When you define energy efficiency, your ideal, literally in terms of, the, you know, no friction, um, no mechanics, no waste of the energy, then you've got your maximum efficiency. We would be, we might be at 1% of that. We don't know. So there's plenty of room to improve that, I agree. Okay. Uh, and that's what we really, in sense, is a hope for humanity, that we can actually do that in the next century. Right. Tim. Okay. Um, one thing I was interested in is you mapped the energy of the capita. Yeah. It looked very similar to the unemployment, the U.S. unemployment, the yeah. U.S. employment graph. Yeah, I know. And there's, there's a good argument behind that, that if you think about what's happening with our technology, you know, we are getting to the stage where we're going to be able to produce output with virtually no unskilled labour input whatsoever. Really, it's quite possible in the next century that the only labour that exists will be skilled labour. And I mean highly skilled labour. Okay. So the trend, the trend we're seeing there, there may be some reason why they're similar. But the, also what I'm saying there, with the, the drop might have more to do with less economic activity because you said that our living standards are the same, but I think there's millions of Americans well, there's certainly got worse off since 2000. We know that the employment rate peaked in 2000 and then the conditions got worse for workers since then. And that's what we see in the energy graph as well as the employment graph. So there is potentially something there. But it's still too early for me to say. Um, why do you start with the capitalists at the beginning? Hmm? I mean, why do you start with a capitalist? At the, you start of your, it's you start with a capitalist with yeah. neighboring capital. Yeah. Why oh, it's because it, 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 there's a sense there's a sensibility to it. It's that if you don't actually change the, the size of your of your blast furnaces and you double how many blast furnaces you have and you double your workers, you double your output of steel. It's just the fact that it's got that constant returns to scale expression. I could use, uh, you know, um, what they call the other other form you get that lets you flip map between the CES production function. I could have used that, but it's just simpler to start this way. And when it dropped out, because you explained most of what's missing in the Cobb-Douglas with energy, then I'm not too fussed about getting a more sophisticated form. We'll need to consider one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, what, what better way to take over the Cobb-Douglas production? Neoclassicals, hopefully, referees won't be able to reject it on site. Yeah. You have Cobb-Douglas restricted to constant returns to scale. Just for the heck of it, yeah. I could make them variable. That some people might want to call that a restricted assumption. It is, but it's, a, it's one I can actually take out of the way and see what happens. Is what the, the restrictive assumption of Cobb Douglas is equating the exponents to the returns of the, the marginal product of the factors, and that's no longer an issue here. Yep. The CES production functions have awful dimensional issues. Pardon? C, C, yes, CES production functions have awful problems with units consistency. Right, yeah. Well, well, maybe you really fiddle around with it to make it work. Well, maybe this might work with uh, as a different way of doing. It. It's worth a try. I would, again, I, just this I, wonder, I wonder if um, in the confusion between kind of GDP and Linux, I, I wonder if it's better to kind of, or one way of thinking about it is, is as some kind of decomposition of total energy used per year yeah. into energy used by labour and energy used by capital. That's fair enough. Yeah. Because I mean, I, I was just thinking when you say, oh well, they all get clever and energy used per machine goes down, then you know, GDP as most of energy goes mm -hmm. down. I mean, no one is happier when GDP goes up anyway. <laughs> so, so why worry about it? You know what I mean? But, it's, none, it's but, but nonetheless, what we've done as a species is go from consuming trivial amounts of energy per head yeah. to enormous amounts of energy per head. And that's really the major reason why we've got such a highly standard living, even looking at the distribution as it stands now. The poorest person here going back home will use more energy than King Henry VIII would have used to travel the same distance. Okay. And travel in more comfort as well. On that point, by the way, being uncomfortable here, I've got an interview starting in five minutes on Russia today. So, mind if I finish at that? Thank you for a great discussion.